Oh, hi, welcome to the Chase Oaks YouTube channel. I'm Darby and I am super excited because right now we're in a series called At The Movies and that's where we take some box office hit movies, some of my favorite movies from the last year, and we pull out some biblical truths from them that you might not expect. Here's the deal though, because of like copyright stuff, we can't show those messages on YouTube. So you gotta come in person or you can check out the description to see this week's At The Movies movie. Just like a hint for you, I think it's Star Wars-y but like not, so watch it and let me know what you think. Anyway, here on YouTube though, we're not leaving you high and dry for the first time ever. We are giving some At The Movies awards to some very deserving people who've given some of the best messages from the last year from the Chase Oak stage. So, uh, and then we'll watch them together. So this week we are awarding best message adapted from a book. Can I get a drum roll please? Thank you. Oh, I can't wait, I wonder who it is. <laughs> and the winner is Jeff Jones from Rebranding Christianity. Oh my gosh, that was a great book and a great message. I cannot wait to watch it together right here with you. So let's check it out now. And so I was starting to talk about the problem and get to the solution. And a, about a 25 year old girl was there uh, sitting next to uh, some, a, a friend and she raised her hand and she said, hey, can I, can I add something to the conversation? It's like, sure, yeah, yeah, love you too. And she said, well, I can tell you your problem as Christians in this culture is that Christians are full of spit. Now, she didn't say spit, but I'm not gonna say that word. Okay, I'm a pastor, this is church, I'm not gonna, some pastors are like the cool cussing kind, I'm not, and I don't think that's cool. We're increasingly a post-Christian culture, but it wasn't that long ago that it was kind of just a thing, like it was just part of being, a, and I'm not, I'm not saying that back in the day, that the church was perfect or that there weren't big problems and all that kind of stuff. But I'm just evoking a time where Christianity was respected, was admired, was something that people aspired to. If anything, when you thought of a Christian, you thought of somebody that wasn't just good, but maybe too good. You know, like a little too good. Like when I, I started following Jesus eighth going into ninth grade, um, I started dating a girl who was, everybody knew was a Christian. And my friends at the time, especially at school, I had church friends and school friends, and all my school friends were not Christians. And so when I started dating her, they were like, ooh, you know, you're dating a Christian. And it's kind of like, she's too good for you. Like you're gonna ruin her and, or something like that. And, but I think now, increasingly in that generation, if an eighth grader or ninth grader now started dating a Christian, for a lot of people, it'd be like, ew, gross. Like, why would you do that? I mean, I, I, I had a, you know, in the book, and by the way, when I talk about the book, it's a tool to try to, and just pray for it, to try to change the conversation in the wider church and to, in, in ways that we'll talk about today. And if you want a book, and right now it's hard to afford a book, you email me, jeff.jones at chaseoaks.org and I'll, we'll send it to you, okay? No, there's no question, no anything. And uh, we'd love to, um, love to do that. But in that book, uh, there's a, a pastor and an author named Larry Osborne who endorsed it. And in his endorsement, I thought it was well said. He said, rebranding Christianity reveals why Christianity has gone from being respected to tolerated to canceled in a few short decades. And I would add, respected, tolerated, to canceled, I would go a little bit further to becoming repulsive. Not to us, but to people outside of us, when, to people outside of Christianity. That in, increasingly, we're not just seen as sort of, the way it used to be when I started leading this church, where we were kind of seen as not relevant. Now we're increasingly seen in culture as repulsive. And it's a whole different kind of thing to get over when you're trying to win people over to Jesus. Now, to echo that, I, I tell a story in the book that is a little bit of a shocking story. Um, and uh, it was at a pastor's conference in, here in Dallas, actually. So I was in this room talking about rebranding Christianity. It was before the book was even written or anything. But I was talking about this issue we have with the perception of Christianity in our culture and being so opposite of what Jesus said we should be known for and how do we, what do we do about that? And, and so I, at the beginning of that, I started out this room just full of pastors. And, and I said, hey, I know it's, 
it's kind of weird thinking about Christianity as a brand, like Levi's or Coca-Cola or Chick-fil-A. Well, it's not a weird thing about Chick-fil-A and Christianity, but you know, it's a, uh, it's, it's kind of, it may be weird thinking about that. Um, it, some different connotations may come to mind that you know, don't fit, but just think about it a little bit. Everything is a, is a brand. Um, a, a brand is just simply the, the perceptions a, around a, a person or product or a group or anything like that. It's, it's, it's what identifies them. It's what you think of when you think of them. There's a promise attached to that. I mean, even people have a brand. Like, that's why you've probably said of somebody at one time, you know, when they, somebody said something or did something uncharacteristic, you were like, well, that doesn't sound like her. That doesn't sound like him, right? It's off brand. That's not who they are. And Jesus talked about how we should be known. And so in one way to analogize that, one way to think about that is a brand. And so in, in, this here, in the conversation, I just threw out some iconic brands and said, so when you think about that brand, what associations do you have with that brand? And then I did Christianity. And so I want you to think not as a room full of pastors, but think, think of yourself as a person outside of Christianity, looking at Christians right now, especially in the emerging generations, if they were gonna choose words to say, what would they say? What would you think? Well, here's what they said. Mean, judgmental, hypocritical, arrogant, exclusive, and angry. Other than that, we're pretty awesome, but you know, but it's a, but that's what they, you know, and it is, you know, that in, that's what surveys and stuff say. I mean, they, when, when people are asked, those are the kind of words that are used by the emerging generations when they think about Christians and when they think about church. And so I was starting to talk about the problem and get to the solution, and a, about a 25-year-old girl was there uh, sitting next to uh, some, a, a friend, and she raised her hand, and she said, hey, can I, can I add something to the conversation? It's like, sure, yeah, I'd yeah, love you to. And she said, well, I can tell you your problem as Christians in this culture, is that Christians are full of spit. Now she didn't say spit, but I'm not gonna say that word. Okay, I'm a pastor, this is church, I'm not gonna. Some pastors are like the cool cussing kind, I'm not, and I don't think that's cool. But um, I, I think good language is good. But if we did have to make a decision in the book about do we just quote her or not, and you just read it and see what we did. But, um, but she said Christians are full of spit. Which, in a pastor's conference, it's like, okay, we didn't expect that one. And so I said, well, elaborate on that a little bit. And, here's, and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna read from the book because I wanna get it right, what she said. She said, well, my friend invited me to come today, and I've spent most of the day wondering why I'm here at a conference for pastors. I'm not even a Christian, and I have no desire to be. But now maybe I know why I'm here, because I'm the person you're talking about. I can tell you from my experience that when I say Christians are full of spit, I mean that they say good things about how much they love people, but they're actually the biggest haters in the world. They're mean to people who are already mistreated. They're arrogant and pushy with their opinions about how the rest of the world should live. They don't even live by the standards that they judge everyone else by. And if Christians wonder why people are turning away from the church, it isn't because Christians are, it, it is because the Christians are collectively the worst of humanity, she said. Some, like my friend next to me, are different from the norm. People like her keep me open enough to Jesus that I agreed to come today. But overall, Christians are the worst. That was just her perspective. Um, I invited her to just keep talking. Every once in a while in the, in the little seminar, I would point to her and say, what are you saying? What are you thinking? We had a great conversation after. She, I, I, I'm convinced she left that seminar closer to being open to Jesus than when she started, for sure. But she does speak for a generation. And we don't have, I mean, that's not an opinion, that's just data. Like, if you wanna get de depressed, like, like maybe you came to church today and you're feeling really good, and you think, I feel so good, I think I need to get depressed. Let me tell you how to do it this weekend. So just Google millennials in Christianity, or millennials in church, or Google Gen Z, the generation below that, Gen Z in church, Gen Z in Christianity. And you'll get depressed, it's not pretty. Um, now, I only want us to get mildly depressed because then I can lift us out of it. So I'm just gonna share two data points, okay? And the first one is about perception of Christianity in the youngest generations of adults right now. Um, and, and this is pretty striking because uh, uh, Gallup did this study in 2001 
and then again in 2021, 20 years later. So 2001, they surveyed the youngest generations of adults then, um, which were Gen X actually, and, and, and kind of the older Gen X now. And they said, they were trying to get to the perception of Christianity, positive or negative. Like, do you have a positive perception of Christianity in this culture or a negative perception of Christianity? So in 2001, in that age group, 61% had a positive attitude toward Christianity. Even if they weren't Christian, you know, Christians are good people, they're doing good stuff and all that. When they did the same study in 2021 of the same age group, not the same people, right? They've gotten older, but the same age group. Guess what their percentage was? 37% had a positive, which meant 63% negative view of Christianity. That's a massive shift. Now, that's perception. Engagement by generation. So right now, at least last year, if you're in a, the builder, uh, the old, you know, kind of older adult age group, it's like 90% of people claim to be Christian. If you're a baby boomer, in the 60s percentile who claim to be Christian. Millennials, significant, Gen X lower. Millennials, significantly lower. All the way down to Gen Z, and 36% claim to be Christian. Gen Z is the first generation where those with no religious affiliation, called nuns, N-O-N-E, no religious affiliation, outnumber those who claim to be Christian. 48% nuns, 36% Christian claim to be Christian. Um, millennials are tight, like it's just right there, you know, uh, which is, again, striking. Now, you put those two things together, those two stats together, 37%, 36%, you know what that tells us? Is that for Gen Z right now, people in our culture, if they're Christians, they're positive about Christianity. If they're not, they're not. They're repulsed by it. That's a really big deal. Because for some of us, this isn't a statistic. This is people we know. If you're younger, these are your friends. If you're older, these are your kids. Or maybe your grandkids. And you're wondering why so many in that generation are walking away from Christianity, walking away from church, and it's not just a theoretical thing. I mean, what we're talking about is the stakes are high. The faith of the next generation is at stake. And you tell me, what is the faith of the next generation worth? I'd say pretty much anything. And when we think about, man, okay, if that's happening and that's, what do we do about that? And there's different approaches, right? You can get despondent and just throw up your hands and say, I don't know, you know, that's no good. You can get defensive, like a lot of people do get defensive and just think, oh, it's not fair. We're actually, we're awesome. And we get mistreated by media. We're victims of, you know, media hates us. And there's this conspiracy and they, people want to do all that. And hey, all that stuff is probably happening. But what we're going to see today is Jesus doesn't give us the luxury of, of seeing ourselves as victims. I can't control what media or anybody else does. And what the early Christians had to face was way worse than what we have to face. And what they did is they listened to Jesus and put in practice what he asked them to put in practice. And that is to say, it is my responsibility to be known for what Jesus asked us to be known for, to be on brand. And church history shows that when Christians do that, then we can win over a skeptical and even hostile world. And therefore, I want us to look at what's happening in these generations and what's happening right now with hope if we're willing to get back on brand. And next week we'll talk about how we tend to get off brand and, and how that's happened. And this week we're gonna say, what would it look like to maybe get it right? And so there's, there's some different, because you think, well, what is the Jesus brand? Like, what is it? And there's different passages I could look at, because he talked a lot about this, like in his big sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. Or you could look, and if you're not a Christian or church person, you probably don't know what this means, and it's okay. The great command. You know, when he's asked, what is spirituality? In the end, he says, love God, love people. But where I want us to look today, because I think it's just the clearest, because this is where he says, this is how people will know you're my followers. Like, this is your thing. This is your brand. This is how we roll, is in what's called the new command that he gives at the Last Supper. 
The Last Supper, because it was a very dramatic evening with his disciples, they were celebrating this Jewish Passover meal, this celebration, and Last Supper, because after this meal, he's going to go to the Garden of Gethsemane and pray, and there Judas will betray him. He'll be arrested, and the next day will die on the cross, be crucified, die on the cross for the sins of the world, three days later raised from the dead. So this is his last time with the disciples before all that happens. These are like his last words. And you know in movies where people are giving, like they're about to die and it's their last words, you know, everybody's leaning in and it's like, tell my wife I love her or, you know, the the, the, the treasure is in my, you know, whatever. And you're like, ah, you know, so it's the last, everybody's, it's a dramatic moment. And he makes it more dramatic the way he does it in the original language of the New Testament but here's how he starts, and, and you can feel the drama. He says, my children, I'll be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I'm going, you cannot come. That's drama. But again, as I said, he gets even more dramatic. He then says, he, he's leaving them with something. A new command is what he's leaving. This is your thing. This is what I'm leaving you with. This is your marching orders. A new command I give you. Now, when I said he makes it dramatic in the original language, Greek in the New Testament, this is, you know, translated. But in Greek, it, this is high drama because, for one, the word he uses for new is not the normal word for new. It's a word that means novel, never before seen. Like, you've never heard about this. You've never seen this. The command I'm about to give you, your marching orders, you've never heard this. This is crazy new. Novel. Never before seen. Not only that, he makes it emphatic. He puts it in the sentence structure in that language. You could do that in a way that it's like putting in a neon lights that flash. New command, never before seen. Big deal. Here we go. <clears throat> and then he says what it is. A new command I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know you're my disciples if you love one another. You get the idea what the new command is? It's love one another. Now, for the disciples, we know what happened. It went over their head. Because Peter, right after this, is like, oh, that's sweet. Um, love one another. Yeah, thanks. I'll put it on a pillow or something. But, but uh, what about this? You're going somewhere that we can't go? Like, wh where are you going? And Jesus has to return to it at the end of the conversation in John 15. And he repeats the same thing. A new command I give you. This is how people will know that you're my followers if you love one another. And the reason it kind of went over their head, I think, is the reason it go over our head, because it doesn't sound new. Right? I mean, it, it, Jesus talked a lot about love. The Old Testament talks about love. I mean, if Jesus had said something novel, it might have been, everybody, shave your head. And be, okay, yeah, that's new. Or, you know, everybody get a WWJD bracelet or something. Yeah, okay, that'll do it. Everybody will know where you're following. But it didn't seem new. Because in the Old Testament, Leviticus, it says, love your neighbor as yourself. That's a pretty high bar. When Jesus comes in the Sermon on the Mount, he, gets, he does get kind of novel because he says, hey, don't just love people who love you back. How about you love people who don't love you? In fact, you love people who hate you and who despise you and who persecute you. You love your enemy and do good to them and bless them and pray for them. That was new, but he's already said that. So what was new about the new command? What's new about the new command, and they would get it, is the phrase, just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Just as I have loved you. Now that takes the bar way high. Jesus is saying, hey, you've hung out with me for a few years. And the way I've loved you, that's the way you're to love each other. And when he says love each other, I don't think he's just talking about only love the 12, or even only love believers, even though, as we learn elsewhere in the New Testament, it starts there and then spills over. The brotherhood, uh, love the brotherhood, and then be, do good to all men, so it's both. But he's just saying, and Jesus loved broadly. So he's just saying, hey, you love like I love, and that's how we should be known, if you love like that. Now, they had just seen a few minutes before an incredible display of that love because Jesus washes their feet, which we don't do. Thank the Lord, we don't do that. But you know, they lived on really yucky, cruddy streets. They would take off their shoes. And when people came in for a meal, usually there was a servant there and it was the lowest servant of all that would wash feet. 
Nobody washed anybody's feet. And so Jesus, that they've now come to know as God in human form, their creator, takes off his outer robe, gets a towel and starts to wash their feet. And they're like, no, you can't do, you're, no, you, you, you. And, and what he says, and what he's letting them know is, that's what I want you to do. This is how we roll. We set aside ourselves for the sake of others. And that Jesus is showing us what God is like. I don't know if you realize this, but God is the most humble being on the planet. He's the most self-sacrificing. Uh, he's the most selfless being on the planet. And Jesus is saying, that's what I want you to do. And then in John 15, when he repeats it, he makes it even high, ratchets up even higher, because there he says, there's no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. And they had no idea what he was talking about. But the next day they would, as he dies on the cross for the sins of the world. And what Jesus is saying is, the way you and I should be known, the way Christians should be known is the most loving people on the planet. A love that is humanly impossible. A love that can only, Jesus kind of love, can only be empowered by God to even love to that level. So that there's no, it's like, wow, where else is that? Who's that forgiving? Who's that generous? Who's that gracious? Who's that kind? Who's, uh, nobody. Like, I don't even understand these people. That's the way it should be. Now think about what Jesus said <clears throat> or what he didn't say. Because he didn't say this. He didn't say, this is how people know you're my disciples. Here's your thing. If you're more right than everybody else and let people know it. That's not what he said. Now that's tricky, right? Because better to be right than to be wrong. And truth is a wonderful thing. We have truth to share. We have the best news in the world to share. And so don't hear me in this series, and we'll actually give a week to this of how do we balance all this out at the end. But don't hear, the, don't hear me saying, and some of you are already worried about it, that, oh, you just love people and there's no lie. Like you just tell everybody they're great and you don't, you don't give truth and you're throwing truth away in love. Love does not do that. Love does not throw away truth. Love does not act like something that is not true is true. Love doesn't look at somebody who's walking off a cliff, you know, on a path that you know is gonna go off a cliff and say, all right, good, good luck. It's not loving, right? Love points people to truth. And guess what? They're symbiotic. Truth, the most important truth in the world is love. We'll talk more about that at the end. But if we actually care about truth, we'll do what Jesus said. To love like he loved. Because what does that do? It actually creates curiosity. It creates pull. It just, just being pushy creates resistance. Being loving in the way Jesus talked about creates a sense of, man, what makes you guys tick? Like, what's your deal? And what church history shows is that when Christians love that way, they win over a world in the way, a skeptical and even hostile world, the way Jesus said. And I know we're pretty far from it, but what would it look like to get there? Um, and, and church history, as I said, gives us some incredible examples. Like the early church, it's an incredible story. So in the first couple hundred years of the church, they had so much more against them. I mean, we, we, we look at right now how Christians are perceived and how younger generate, all this kind of stuff we talk about. And we think, oh man, that's terrible. That's really hard. What are we gonna do? The first Christians had a way, way bigger difficulty than we do in terms of perception of Christianity and the hostility toward Christianity than we do. Um, for one, I mean, they were right there in the Jewish areas where it was done. The Jewish leaders wanted it stamped out because they didn't believe Jesus was the Messiah and they persecuted Christians and had misinformation campaigns against Christians. The Romans, even more so, as Christianity began to spread, the Roman hierarchy hated Christianity because Christians didn't worship the emperor. And emperors didn't like that. And they didn't want that to spread. And so there's these massive misinformation campaigns. That, that's not new. You know, now people can hear about Russia and all this stuff. and That's not new. That's been going on forever. And they used, and so they, they would spread all these rumors against Christians to sway popular opinion against Christianity to justify the waves of persecution that they did. So for example, they called Christians atheists. Don't you think, well, that's weird, right? They actually believe in God, but they didn't believe in the Roman gods. And so what they, what they spread was, hey, these Christians don't believe in the Roman gods. And when, tra and when tragedies would happen and volcanoes and hurricanes or whatever happened, they say the reason it is because these Christians and as Christianity is growing, they don't worship the gods. The gods are angry. If you just lost your house, blame them. 
because they're the reason. They called them impious because they weren't religious in the Roman way. Impious Galileans, we'll hear a Caesar talk about that. That's the phrase he used of Christians. Impious is two slam words put together. Impious, atheistic, non-religious, and Galileans, which is where Jesus was from. But that was like the stick. So it'd be like today saying impious Alabamans. And I'm from Alabama, because I can say that, right? Roll tie, I love it, I'm, I'm all for it. If my neck is red, then okay, that's fine. But, uh, but it was like a redneck, it was like a, it was a slur. They also spread the, the rumors that Christians were cannibalistic. They we ate human flesh and drank blood. Why? Because of communion, right? Where we drink the, eat the bread and drink the wine, or in our case, grape juice, in a way to um, remember the body and blood of Jesus. But what they spread is, yeah, these people are cannibals. They also spread that we were incestuous, uh, that we you know, did things with our brothers and sisters that we shouldn't do. Why? Because Christians, you know, Christianity was a family of God and it was, um, they call each other brothers and sisters. And so they just use that to see, yeah, they're sickos. Look at what they're doing. Of course, I mean, none of that was true, obviously, but that's what was spread. And it would justify these horrible persecutions. So Christians, I'm just saying Christians had a lot going against them. So much so that one of the big mysteries of history is how did Christianity survive? Much less, not just survive, but in a fairly short time, become the most dominant ideology in the world. I mean, they literally won the Roman world over to Christianity. <clears throat> and how did that happen? And it's, I love this, because when you look at secular historians, not just Christian historians, but secular historians that look at that historical problem, because there's no parallel to it, it's what all of them boil it down to. I mean, there's a few factors, but what they all boil it down to is the primary reason is a kind of love displayed that nobody could argue with. That these were the most loving people on the planet in a way that the planet just didn't see it coming. So for example, how that played out in the first Christians is they developed church, right? They, and, and they began to develop church. It took a while for them to figure it out. God helped them. But they developed the first diverse community that that world had ever seen. The first welcoming community, inclusive community, whatever word you want to use. It was the, we think our world is polarized and segregated and to tribes and there's vitriol and anger against each other and us versus them, because it is. But nothing compared to the Roman world. In the Roman world, citizen and not citizen did not mix socially. This race and that race were at enmity with each other, hated each other, they didn't mix. Slave and free, rich and poor, did not mix. Women were seen as not, you know, not, not even just not equal, but undesirable, except for reproduction, which is why so many girl babies were put out for exposure to die. By the way, Christians would find them and take care of them. But, um, but that was the Roman idea of women. Christianity comes along and says, no, we are all made in God's image and all equal. Men, women, rich, poor, this race, that race, it doesn't matter. And like Galatians 3, in Christ, there is no man or woman, slave or free, rich or poor, whatever, this race, that race. The world had never seen that. I mean, we kind of take it for granted, that idea, but the world had never seen that until Christianity and it's part of what won the world. And they didn't just get together, but they loved each other and they cared for each other so much so that there weren't needs in the church because whenever somebody had a need, other people would meet it. And then that love spilled out toward the community in ways that the Roman world, a stoic philosophy that just was sort of the survival of the fittest. And if you're poor, it's because you deserve it and you're weak and or what if you're sick or whatever. And Christianity, of course, compassion, God's compassion and, went and, and served the poor and loved the poor and so much so, this is from Tertullian, and I know I'm nerding out a little bit here, but this is a guy from the second century, a Christian, a historian, who said, it is our care of the helpless, our practice of loving kindness that brands us in the eyes of many of our opponents. Only look, they say, look how they love one another. Caesar, uh, one of the Caesars in the third century, a guy named Julian, um, was so frustrated with the growth of Christianity that he sent, and we have these letters, he sends these letters out all over the empire to the pagan priest saying, would you guys get it together? Because we're losing. Christianity is growing like crazy. They don't worship me. They don't worship our gods. 
And we got to learn something. And here's what he said. You can hear his cynicism. He says, I think that when the poor happen to be neglected and overlooked by the priests, this is to one priest, the impious Galileans observed this and devoted themselves to benevolence. He thought it was a strategy. To, he didn't know, just that's what, that's what impious Galileans do. In another letter, he says, the impious Galileans support not only their own poor, but ours as well. Everyone can see that our people lack aid from us. He's trying to kind of kick them in the rear, and he's saying, guys, would you start being like them? Would you just start being nice to people or something? Because they're winning. Not only that, but in the waves of persecution, guess what Christians did? Exactly what Jesus told them to do. Persecution for them was an opportunity to show love to their enemy, to bless their persecutor, to pray for them, and they did. And they were persecuted in the worst ways. I mean, I'm talking about killed in the Colosseums for sport, covered with tar, lit on fire alive to light Nero's parties in the gardens, hung upside down to ridicule them, or crucified upside down to ridicule them. And as all that was happening, you know what they did? They prayed for their tormentors and persecutors. That's how they died, praying for them. And a watching world looked on and said, hey, look, that's not normal. That doesn't just happen. There's something about those people. And they literally won over a skeptical and hostile world. Listen to what Paul said in Colossians, and I think he would say it today to us. He said, live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity, every engagement, every interaction. Let your conversation, your engagement with people in culture be gracious and attractive. Uh, the word actually relates to salt, to be so salty that people, salt makes you want more, tastes good, makes you thirsty. Related to the way people actually want more of you, not less. Be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone, appropriate in our interaction and engagement. I mean, honestly, if all you do is that verse, you don't have to read the book. I'll, I'll make it easy for you. That's rebranding Christianity in a nutshell. First Peter, Peter's writing to Christians in Rome in the heart of paganism, who are facing persecution, hostility, and all that. And he's telling them, hey, you relate in a way that silences people who have bad things to say about you. And they actually creates curiosity about what makes you tick. First Peter 3 says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope you have. Meaning, so different that people are like, what's your deal? How can you in this world that's so broken have so much hope? Like, you're not like everybody else. You're not living in fear. You're not being mean to people who disagree with you. You're not, you know, what's your deal? But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. You know how you handle people who, maybe they are unfair in the way they see us is you just live in such a way that they realize, wow, I was wrong. These people are, these people are amazing. What, what makes them tick? That, that's what Peter's saying to the Romans, and I, I believe what he would say to us today. It's, it's taking responsibility to live in this world the way Jesus told us to live in this world. By this, all men will know that you're my disciples. If you love one another, if you love people the way I love people, and that's how we should be known. And just like thousands of years ago in other periods of church history shows that whenever Christians do that, empower, God empowers it and they become an irresistible force for good in their world. And I believe that's what, I, I believe it's what God wants to do now. And what this, not just in our church, but this movement that I hope happens because there's other voices saying the same thing as God is at work of saying, hey, let's get back on brand. We've gotten off brand. Let's get back on brand. So what does this mean for you and me to get it right? Let's think about it collectively and individually. So collectively as a group, what that means is what God would call us to be as a church is the most loving, in every church, in every location, the most loving group of people in that locale. So much so people would be like, wow, these people are nuts. 
Like they're not just normal. I mean, everybody wants to be nice, but these people are crazy what they do for other people. They're crazy how they forgive. They're crazy. Man, you can be mean to them and they're the most kind people on social media you can imagine. They're not angry. They're not pushy. Because what God wants is to create a sense of pull, right? Not push. We'll talk about that next week. That's how we, right? And let me just say something. I'll make it more specific, but let me say something as your pastor. I don't talk like this very often, but that's what I am, and I'll be accountable to you. I, I don't know if you realize this, but one day as a pastor, I'll stand before God, and I'll give an account, not just for my life, but you. And Paul said to Christians, like, hey, don't make me look bad on that day. Um, and let me just say, and I'm getting emotional here, I'm proud of you. I'm really proud of you. Paul talked about, man, we just want to spread the fragrant aroma of Jesus. Why? So that people are attracted. And I believe that you're spreading the fragrant aroma of Jesus in our community. I believe the reputation of Jesus has grown and is growing and increasing in our community for those far outside of Christianity because of you. And what I mean is this, a church that is externally focused, not internally focused. A church that's willing to say, we're not here for us, we're here for others. A church that comes alongside community partners with love and meets the biggest needs in our community and with all that you're doing through local good, I mean, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of you serving. It's a beautiful thing. So much so when I met uh, the newish mayor of Plano, he's been mayor for a little while, but I, haven't, I hadn't met him yet until about, I don't know, six months ago or so. And the first thing he said to me when he found out I was pastor of Chase Oaks Church, he was like, wow, Chase Oaks Church. He said, do you realize you're the brightest bright spot in our community? He said, I mean, when I, when I see what you do through, he knew about the local good center, he knew what we were doing with community partners, he, he knew, he even knew that we were a diverse church that walked in everybody. I don't know how he knew all that, but he was like, man, I'm so thankful for you. And that's what we want, right, is our community. And I don't know where he's at spiritually, but for people who are, are, who are not us to be thankful for us. That's what Jesus said. The people glorify the Father in heaven because of the good works that you do. And, and yeah, could we do better? Yeah, but thank you for what you're doing. And we'll talk about community more in a future week, but... We just thank you for being the people you are and putting the love of Jesus in practice and meeting the biggest needs in our community. And for those of you, especially for those of you who are engaged, you're giving, you're serving, you're doing it. And, and hey, some of you are kind of fans. You're, you're on the sidelines and you're watching and cheering and we need that too, so thank you. But I'd invite you to get out of the stands and onto the field. We just did a survey, um, found out that about 25% of people at Chase Oaks serve in some way. Like, in, and thank you for that. Like, serve in kids' zone or serve in leading a group or doing these services or however it campuses, youth ministry, whatever, which is awesome. Creating environments where people can encounter the love of God. And then, or serving in the community through our community partnerships or our local good. That's awesome, 25%. But imagine if it was 50%. If we could double the love poured out in this community. 75%. I mean, 100% holy moly. This community would not know what hit them. That's like 10 or 12,000 people empowered by God, just like it would be a holy moly. And let me just encourage you when, to be open to just say, and you can, you can go to your hub at your location, uh, wherever you're at right now, uh, if you're at a physical campus, and just say, yeah, I wanna serve, or go online and learn that QR code on the scene in front of you your host talked about earlier. That'll just take you to a new people thing. You might say, I've been here 10 years. Doesn't matter, just do it, and somebody will contact you, and you can talk about whatever you wanna talk about. And then let's think individually. Collectively, but individually. You realize that everywhere you are is not random. It may feel random, but it is not. It is a placement, 1 Corinthians 7 says, an assignment that God loves people in your neighborhood, at your golf club, at your workplace, at your school, at your fraternity, your sorority, wherever you're at, your team, whatever. He loves those people so much he put you there as an assignment. 
You have an assignment. What, to represent Jesus there. You're like his brand ambassador. That's how, my guess is you're here. Why? Because somebody invited you here that you respected enough to say yes. Right? Most of us are, or whatever church you became a Christian in or whatever. I mean, just like that girl we talked about. You remember the spit girl? I have to be careful. I just need to not say it. But, but you remember her? What did she say? Hey, the reason I'm here and what keeps me in the conversation is her. Because she's not like that. And that's what you and I get to be for everybody, everywhere we're placed, we get to be that girl for, I'll have to, I don't know, let's call her Shanda, uh, Shanda, uh, or whoever her name is, I don't know. We get to be that for them, everywhere we go. And so here's what I want us to do, two things to make this very practical. And I want us to do this through the whole series, okay? So the first thing I want us to do through this series just remember the white, what would Jesus do bracelet thing. I want you to think that way everywhere you go. Every day start, just ask God this. Every time you go into a lunch with somebody, a meeting with somebody, or even you're walking through the hallway or you're wherever you are in your home, school, neighborhood, work, whatever. And just say, God, today I wanna be, I wanna love like Jesus. I, I wanna love with Jesus kind of love. That, I, wanna do, I wanna be the brand. I wanna do what you say. And, so, and I can't do it on my own. I need your power to do that. And so God, would you help me to respond to people the way Jesus would? To be as generous as Jesus would, to be as gracious as generous would, as kind as Jesus would, as self, selfless as Jesus would, as, as practically helpful as Jesus would. And just go, go through every day with that in mind, every encounter, everything. And, and just start practicing and doing this whole series and just see what God does. And, and, if, and as God does stuff, and he will, let me know. Jeff.jones at chaseoaks.org. I'd love to hear the stories of what God does. Because I'm telling you, if you do it, people would be like, uh, why are you doing this? Which is a great opportunity, like Peter said, to give the reason for the hope that you have. Oh, man, I, it's just the way God loves me. I'm just trying to pay it forward. What do you mean? Just, just see what God does. And then I want to make it even more specific. So when you came in, uh, you should have gotten one of these if you're at a physical location. This is not a name tag like we did a few weeks ago. At least it's not for your name. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to write a name of one, one name, one person in your life that you would say, you know what? When I think of what Jeff is talking about, I, this, this is the one person through this series that I'm really thinking about and praying for and that I wanna bless, and that I wanna do good. Somebody who doesn't know Jesus, maybe who has a pretty dim view of Christianity, maybe it's your child who's walked away. Maybe it's your grandchild who's walked away. Maybe it's your friend who's walked away, or maybe they were never in, and they're just out, and they, they have a very, maybe they've been hurt by church, or they have a very dim view of church, or Jesus, or whatever, right? And, and just think, man, I would, I, 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 wanna, I wanna be praying for them and I wanna think about not just every, I mean, yeah, everybody all day and all that, but this is the one person that, God, would you give me wisdom, just how I could express your love to them somehow in this series. And what I want us to do is write the first name, if you already wrote the last name, that's fine, but the first name, and at your campus, there's these big signs that say rebrand. And what we want you to do is peel off the thing and stick that person's name on there. And, uh, it's just a visual reminder that we all have somebody that we're praying about. And if during the week you wanna come into, the, in, into your lobby and just pray for those names alongside other Chase Oakers, pray for those names, but it'll just be a visual reminder that what this comes down to is just you and me living out what Jesus asked us to live out, living out the brand. Because what Christianity is, is not an organization, it is not an institution. Jesus didn't come to, to start another nonprofit. You know, it's fine to have that structure and it's good to have that structure. But what he came to start was a movement of radical love that would convince a watching world that he indeed came into this world to know them. So that a watching world would be pulled toward people who have the best news possible. And we're called to be the good news so that we can also share the good news of a God who loves so much he made it possible for people to know him because of what Jesus did on their behalf. 
And that's what we get to be every day, everywhere we are collectively and individually. And God will empower that. We're not on our own. So I'm gonna ask us to just pray, just bow our heads in prayer. And what I always like to do is just get us to pray with each other or just talk to God ourselves. And I want you to say, God, I, I want you to use me to be who you've called me to be right where I am. Help me do that. Like really love the way you've called me to love everywhere you put me. That name that you have on your heart, in your heart right now, just give that name to God and say, God, you love them beyond what I can even imagine. And so would you help me know how to love that person in this series? And would you do a work in their heart, in my heart too? Father, thank you that you're the most loving being in the universe and you call us to reflect that. In Jesus' name, amen.